Welcome to Rob J. Bell's Heritage Webinars. Here's The Strange Death of Corsetry, a story of the life and times of Madame Clapham, a dress designer working from her base in Hull in Yorkshire, whose fascinating salon operated from the 1880s through to the 1960s. My name's Rob Bell. I'm a writer and commentator on heritage and also business themes. Enough said. Let's get started. This is a local story about fashion design, but has a wider significance as we consider the context from 1880 to the swinging 60s. There were economic challenges, a decline in the aristocracy, the rise of the working man, and the fight for women's suffrage. Dresses on the mannequin have to be understood in a wider context. Which brings us to the title, The Strange Death of Corsetry. Years back, George Dangerfield wrote The Strange Death of Liberal England, of how the Liberals won a landslide election in 1906 and then faded from the political scene. Strange death, and so to fashion. I'm often asked, why Madame Clapham? As a family, we were friends with a formidable woman from Cottingham called Pat Rain. Pat was an expert on fashion and Madame Clapham. I have a keen interest in British history. It made for many a lively discussion reflected in what you're about to hear. This webinar is written in Miss Rain's memory, featured here alongside a dress designed for a pageant and one of her very own annotated patterns. Here's the story in three sections. First, we'll define the Madame Clapham style with examples from when she was in her pomp and then place this into a wider social and economic context. And finally, we'll explore the World War I challenge and her legacy. Madame Clapham was born Emily McVitie in Cheltenham in 1857 and moved to Scarborough for a dressmaking apprenticeship with Marshall and Snellgrove. Here she is with her husband, Haig Clapham. They married in 1886. He was an accountant. Emily was a formidable lady and was to assume the title of Madame after a few years in her very own salon. Marshall and Snellgroves was famous for its tailor-made fashions. Some of its patrons would become Madame Clapham's later on, for example, the Sitwells. Here's an example of the work from the store, Sweet Sicily, an evening coat inspired by Worth. This was an era of influential department stores. The French writer Émile Zola wrote Au Bonheur des Dames, Ladies Paradise, all about the extraordinary experience of visiting the likes of Galerie Lafayette in Paris, cloth and design from all over the world. And this was the experience replicated in places like Marshall and Snellgroves and in the salon of Madame Clapham herself. Madame Clapham opened her salon at 1 Kingston Square in 1887, using their joint savings. It expanded into number 2 in 1891, and by the mid-1890s, Madame Clapham is widely regarded as Hull's finest dressmaker. Using a legacy from an aunt, Madame Clapham expands the business into number 3 Kingston Square, which was quite an address to have on the notepaper. Kingston Square was part of the Georgian New Town as Hull grew beyond its old city walls. The Assembly Rooms, opened in 1834, hosted dances, concerts, lectures and social events. Charles Dickens gave readings there. The Hull and East Riding Museum was in the Royal Institute which was destroyed in World War II. Before 1905, the School of Art was also in Albion Street, Hull's own Harley Street or Medical Quarter. St. Charles Borromeo was around the corner, an imposing building with a lavish interior. And even the Christian scientists were located there. The Claphams were ardent practitioners and patrons of their Beverly Road Church. Now, before we look at the dresses, let's remind ourselves of the style of the day. Victorian ladies had a very elaborate dress etiquette, even changing clothing entirely four times a day. They had lighter, looser morning dresses for when they were alone, and afternoon dresses for receiving visitors or friends, on top of the evening and ball gowns for formal occasions. Here's a woman 
being dressed. First, thick, long-legged, long-sleeved woolen combinations. Over them, white cotton combinations with buttons and frills aplenty. Then the suspenders, bony, grey stays, body-hugging. And then, to hide them, with black woolen stockings. And it goes on and on, as Madame Clapper might have said, etc., etc. These dresses were worn by members of the Davis family of Wolfreton Kirkella, close to Hull, and either Mrs. Sarah Davis or her daughter Sally were the wearers. The characteristic 1890s leg of mutton sleeve evolved from the slight kick-up on the left, that's pre-1894, to a fuller upper section, as on the right, in 1895. And both of these appear in the Hull Museum's collection. Here are a few more examples in the whole museum's collection. Mrs. Grotrian, the MP's wife, Mrs. Jameson of East Ella, a mayoress, and this is an ivory silk brocade and bottle green velvet jacket. On the right, an evening outfit for Mrs. Richardson, another mayor's wife in 1896, and this is a pink and cream silk brocade, and that's a bodice decorated with cream satin and pink sequins. The big breakthrough for Madame Clapham came with the Wilsons. The Wilsons of Tranby and of Water, that's Nunburnham, owned the world's biggest shipping line, the Wilson Line. This was the shipping line moving over three million transmigrants from Europe, seeking freedom and opportunity in the Americas from the 1880s to 1914. And that meant quite a lot of disposable income. Muriel, daughter of Arthur Wilson of Tramby Croft, was key to Madame Clapham's success. Muriel was reputed to be one of the most beautiful as well as one of the most eccentric girls in British high society. Anything that she wore was like a brochure across London society. By the way, Tramby Croft was the country seat of the Wilsons and is the place made famous by the Baccarat scandal of 1890 when an army officer was accused of cheating in a game of cards involving Bertie, Prince of Wales. But that's another story. Back to Muriel. Fond of acting, sport and travel, she had an individualistic dress sense. In 1917, Muriel Wilson finally marries at the age of 42. Having turned down dukes and earls, she marries Richard Ward, an army officer, seven years her junior. A Madame Clapham design opportunity. Here, her dress is crème georgette over crêpe de chine, with old rose point lace at the front and also for the square train. And then the Sitwells of Scarborough. Edith, Osbert and Sackerville formed an identifiable literary and artistic clique in London from about 1916 to 1930. Their father, just to give you a flavour, did not like real life because it disrupted his inner reverie of the past, so he avoided it by illness, oddness and self-imposed isolation. Edith, his daughter, makes Lady Gaga look jejeune, in other words, quite dull. For Madame Clapham, this was a coup, and here, one of her dresses in a painting by none other than John Singer Sargent. Then Madame Clapham's most famous client, Queen Maud of Norway. Her grandmother was Queen Victoria. She was close to her brother George and cousin Nicholas of Russia, who, with no reference to Larkin, was called Mr. Toad. She was a character, one of the first royals to smoke a cigarette in public before she was married. Marrying a distant cousin Carl, who would become King of Norway, she had been given Appleton House on the Sandringham Estate, where Madame Clapham would visit for fittings. Let's be clear, Maud was regarded as not stuffy. Carl and Maud cared about democracy. However, she was known for her unique fashion sense. At first, Madame Clapham was in vogue, but then as Maud's love for the outdoors grew, the style emphasis shifted. In fact, her son enrolled at Oxford University and won multiple Olympic gold medals for skiing. And by the way, the waist was a reputed 18 inches. (laughs) 
Tiny and famously elegant, Maud was a patron of Paris designers such as Worth and Poiré, but she was Madame Clapham's patron from at least World War I until her death in 1938. Queen Maud's surviving wardrobe is now in the National Museum of Norway. However, she tended to remove labels from garments, but the modern-looking geometric silk blouse on the right was made by Madame Clapham around 1914. They met regularly at Appleton House, the home in Sandringham, when visiting her brother, or at Claridge's Hotel in London. The clothes would be made in Hull and sent to the Queen by post or train. They did become friends, and the Claphams visited Norway as guests of the Queen. By appointment, too, appeared on Madame Clapham's letterheads, even after her death. And the Claphams had her coat of arms painted on the side of their car. By 1901, Madame Clapham styled herself as court dressmaker. I couldn't find a better photograph, but it does make the point. The client list was impressive. Hilda Grotrian, daughter-in-law of Sir James Reckitt, first baronet of the Hull-based company Reckitt and Sons Limited. Gwendolyn, Duchess of Norfolk, second wife of the 15th Duke of Norfolk. Lady Ida Sitwell, wife of Sir George Sitwell, fourth baronet. Sybil, Countess of Westmoreland, wife of the 13th Earl of Westmoreland. And Grace, Countess of Lonsborough, wife of the second Earl of Lonsborough. So Madame Clapham's gowns were admired from London to New York. In 1918, the Claphams settled at Southwood on South Street in Cottingham, just outside of Hull. And here, by the way, is the Christian Science Church on Beverly High Road, where she was a patron. We've considered her standing in society, so let's look inside the salon itself on Kingston Square. This would have been the scene in the fitting rooms, the very best in decor, and Madame Clapham would select the thinnest of girls to act as mannequins to display the gowns in their best light. As we can see in this illustration, work was divided into specialisation. Seamstresses were generally distinguished from dressmakers, milliners, staymakers, embroiderers and tailoresses by their lower levels of craft and skill. But at the top end of the market, fine sewing was valued. Their existence was precarious and exacerbated by layoffs due to seasonal demand and unpredictable changes of fashion. There was strong spirit of camaraderie amongst the girls who would often socialise together. They were allowed to keep scraps and offcuts and would make things for themselves and each other, for example, as wedding gifts. Mabel Nut Brown worked at Madame Clapham's from 1929, aged 14, to 1940. We did a seven-year apprenticeship and we started at half past eight in the morning until one or two o'clock and then left at six. No tea or coffee break. Conditions were spartan. Although pay was low, the prestige of the firm meant that they took pride in it and in their skills. It wasn't a sweatshop. Those who were not kept on were able to get posts easily in department stores such as Thornton Valley's. This is a photograph of staff in 1908. Make no mistake about this. With a reputation for quality, exclusivity and haute couture, this was the place to work. There's been a tendency to see Madame Clapham as a one-off. In fact, there were several other well-known competitors in Hull. Salters, Shepherdson's, and then the huge premises of Thomas Bark, the general mourning warehouse. Funerals, like weddings, were big business for dressmakers, their bread and butter. Mrs. H. Elizabeth Salter of Wright Street had a larger workforce than Clapham's of over 200 hands and a large showroom with a grandiose shop front. She claimed to visit London and Paris regularly in search of the latest novelties to meet the requirements of each season. Madame Clapham also claimed to visit Paris three to four times a year, and that representatives of the best French houses came over periodically to wait upon me, specially with their newest goods. Even so, there were stories around the workroom that trimmings bought locally were repackaged to make it look as if they were from Paris. Was either of them telling the truth? We'll never know. <laughs> 
Then the bane of Madame Clapham's life, the factory inspector. Due to the state of sweatshops, government legislation was tightening all the time. The Factory Acts of 1883, 1891, 1895, 1901 were all punitive. Legally, the firm was allowed to call three notice nights per week for unpaid overtime to complete urgent orders. But under the Factory Acts of the 1890s, under 16s were not supposed to work overtime at all, and under 18s were not to work later than 9pm. However, despite being fined over this in 1896, Clapham still did it in the 1920s and developed ruses to evade the inspectors. Gladys Carmichael worked at Madame Clapham's and spoke of remembering herself and other juniors hidden in small dark cupboards so the inspectors did not see that we were having to work in the evening. Urgent orders were generally ones with deadline dates such as weddings or mornings and funeral wear and also some VIPs such as Queen Maud necessitated late working. And then there was the march of technology. Many competitors were faster to respond. After all, from the 1860s onwards, Singer sewing machines made stitching 30 times faster than by hand. And this was improving all the time. Then there were quite surprising trendsetters to respond to. Theatre and dance had become spectacular. For example, Diaghilev's Ballet Russe from 1909 to 1910. Here are costumes by Liev Bakst, which had a massive impact on the fashion world, inspiring designers such as Paul Poiré and the Callot sisters. Sherazze, in 1910 in particular, was inspired by Eastern-style fabrics, harem pants and exotic trims such as fur and marabou. And Madame Clapham's style was changing as well. Here are two contrasting wedding dresses. On the left, in 1895, the full leg of mutton sleeves with a long train. On the right, from 1918, simplicity itself. Both are in the Hull Museum's collection. So we move to section two and a wider context. Here's Hull in its golden era. And you can see in Queen Victoria Square, the City Hall built in around 1909. The Guild Hall is behind us here. And that's from about 1906 onwards. The Wilberforce statue looks down upon a bustling city. And locals are making it big. Here is a man born above his parents' shop on English Street, next door to the fishing community of Hesel Road, a solid working-class district in Hull. Joseph, soon to be Sir Joseph Duveen, considered the most spectacular art dealer of all time, with galleries in Paris, London and New York. Devine would eventually bring thousands of artworks over from Europe, which went on to form the foundations of countless American museums like the Frick. In his own words, Europe has a great deal of art and America has a great deal of money. What did this mean for Madame Clapham? At the end of the 19th century, new technology made it easy to import agricultural goods cheaply, which led to a global abundance of grain and sent Europe spiralling into a depression. Suddenly, members of the British and continental aristocracy were willing to part with the heirlooms, paintings and sculptures that would have been untouchable a decade earlier. And then the liberal landslide of 1906 ushered in the people's budget, and this meant heavy taxes for the now penurious or skint landed gentry. Madame Clapham's clients had less money to spend. Devine had spotted the opportunity. Imagine the two meeting to chew the cud. And then the country was boiling with the great unrest, and this, by the way, is covered brilliantly in the book A Strange Death of Liberal England, and strikes were rife. In 1912 alone, 40 million days were lost to strikes. Then we have home rule and votes for women. The fact is that fashion was definitely a tale of two cities, the haves and the have-nots. 
And then the role of women in society was changing. I've done work on the census for 1911 and again for 1921. Across Britain, 40% of the jobs of 1911 had gone 10 years later. Jobs with horses and in service, all gone. Jobs as drivers, women in quite different occupations, all change. And Hull was a port city with many involved in prostitution. Hull was also a hotbed for the suffragettes. For example, Dr Mary Murdoch and her partner Dr Martindale from their GP practice on Beverly High Road were both prominent activists. Mary Murdoch was the first woman with a driving licence and the first woman to get a speeding fine. Top right, Newland High School for Girls, which opened in 1907, and their first colours were those of the suffragette movement. Purple for loyalty and dignity, white for purity, green for hope and of spring. Well-behaved women rarely make history. And then, in August 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, war spread like wildfire, and impacted Hull hard. The port city made its money from the docks and from fishing. The docks were bombed by Zeppelin and then closed for strategic reasons. The same for fishing. With no livelihoods, men volunteered for the whole pals. Women worked the munitions factories or in places like Smith and Nephew, making dressings for the front line. Seamstresses in places like Madame Clapham's left fashion for work in the war effort. Yes, Hull's women responded to the war as elsewhere. The bombing of Scarborough was one outrage that had suffragettes suspend protest and back the war effort, urging men to go to war. And then the women went off to do their bit. Hull's population fell by 45,000 people during the war. And here in the Hull Daily Mail, a summary. Women were now being trained in shipbuilding, the dockyard, transport and munitions, as well as growing food, postal work, telegraph messengers and even taxi driving. Joseph Rank Limited employed nearly 3,000 women in wheat production alone. And if we need an illustration of what this all meant for Madame Clapham, we need go no further than the film Mary Poppins. Featuring an aristocratic family whose matriarch was a suffragette, the idea of expensive fashion had become anathema. To dress extravagantly in wartime is unpatriotic, yelled one poster. And there was a national campaign to make, do and mend. Madame Clapham's appeal to the upper classes was past its sell-by date. We move to post-World War I and the legacy of this once powerful fashion house. Reasons for Madame Clapham not to be cheerful were stacking up. For example, this is what the head teacher of the prestigious Cheltenham Ladies' College, Madame Clapham's hometown, had to say to her pupils in 1919. You are the surplus women. The point she's making is that the old days of the debutante balls and filling the wardrobe full of grand dresses were over, and these women were likely to have to fend for themselves, or at least to do more than they had previously. The world of Madame Clapham's clients was changing utterly. There was a gradual decline of landed gentry and aristocracy, less money in the social scene around the country houses. Many estates were sold off after the war. Money was more urban-based and high society centred more firmly than ever on London. Social life focuses on nightclubs more than balls, with dancers to match. There was a shortage of servants, even if you could afford them. And the Spanish flu had so many people dying that funeral dress, a staple of Madame Clapham's era, declined. And then the change in the kitchen and the home, more appliances, transformed the lives of women. At one level, women were more sporty. Cycling clubs were opening all over the country for women. Golf in culottes, all the rage, and tennis marked the greatest shift. Pre-war, British player Dorothea Lambert Chambers 
one wearing a long skirt, two or three stiff petticoats, and a corset. Winning Wimbledon in 1926, French tennis player Suzanne Longlon wore a flimsy, revealing calf-length cotton frock with short sleeves. Fashion was changing. At another level, more frivolous and independent, in Hull, the Wellington Rooms, that's the Welly today, opened in 1913 as a dance hall, and the music was moving towards jazz. Across Hull, factories had jobs for women, and the likes of Reckitts were making things easier in the home. These changes were reflected in the lives of Madame Clapham's clients as well. Women were taking part in more active sports and activities, as illustrated by Muriel Wilson skating at Samoritz in 1912 and on the beach at Forte di Mari in Italy in 1913. And from her brother's photo album, we can see even more evidence of this change. And now Queen Maud. The Sportif One. Uh, We've already mentioned that her son was winning medals in skiing and she was figuring in all sorts of poses, riding bikes and skiing herself. And then even more contrast from another of Hull's very own. Amy Johnson, aviatrice, engineer and fashion icon, landed in far and distant exotic places in her bomber jacket and unfussy hair. While not many people piloted their own planes, like Amy Johnson, the growth of civilian air travel eroded Madame Clapham's client base still further. Women wealthy enough to afford her work could now afford to fly to Paris and buy direct from the fashion houses that were quickly and conveniently available. The 1930s were not good for Madame Clapham. Breaking her hip at a Christian scientist convention in Chicago in 1931, she was never her vibrant self again. And in 1938, Queen Maud died. Fashion was changing again, and in Coco Chanel, the fashion world had found a fresh voice. In her own words, fashion is not something that exists in dresses alone. Fashion is in the sky, in the street. Fashion has to do with ideas, the way we live, what is happening. And so we have the corseted and full-skirted new look created by Dior in Paris in 1947, which really wasn't too popular in Britain, still affected by rationing. So when rationing ended, Madame Clapham embraced the new look in the patterns seen to the right. And yet her styles were becoming ever more expensive in the local context. Here are some of those post-war prices with their modern day equivalent. There's a 1948 wedding dress selling at 38 guineas. That would be £1,820 today. And a 1951 blue taffeta evening dress with overskirt at £25. That's a snip today at £605. But Hull had been heavily bombed, and during prolonged rebuilding, its wealthier inhabitants and higher quality businesses gradually seeped away. Made to measure was falling, and cheaper off the peg alternatives had become the rage. And so, as made to measure fashion declined, ready to wear from London fashion houses grew. In Hull, the House of Mirel built impressive momentum, and Thornton and Varley rebuilt as Debenhams after the Blitz was another competitor. As one Clapham-trained worker summed things up, Madam Clapham, too much tissue paper to wrap fine garments. Madame Clapham passed away in 1952, and the business was now in the hands of her niece to be run up to 1967. But as the name above the door on Kingston Square, it's still there, the game was over. The swinging 60s called a halt to a fashion house that had once blazed a trail across Europe. Emily McVitie from Cheltenham became the apprentice dressmaker in Scarborough to build a formidable haute couture salon in Hull that held its own with fashion houses across Europe. The flame burned brightest from 1887 to 1914, but kept on moving with trends until it faded during the swinging 60s. This was some achievement at a time when the role of women was changing fast. 
as her impressive client list testifies, this was no provincial backwater. For a time, Hull's haute couture was up there with the best, her eye for detail translating into high standards for the many girls who arrived to learn and left with real skills. Here's a photo of Clapham girls in the 1950s, taken by Emily Wall, Madame Clapham's niece. This was her legacy, the many girls whose pride in their work was still bringing them back to Kingston Square to remember the legacy that they were part of, right up to 2022 after lockdown. I heard of Madame Clapham first from Miss Rain, a Cottingham-based expert on fashion through the ages. This coincided with me reading George Dangerfield's Strange Death of Liberal England and triggered this thought on the strange death of corsetry. It seemed to me that there was more to this story than the dresses. The context was powerful, and in a curious way, something said by the late dress designer Vivian Westwood, the non-conformist par excellence, strikes a chord. In this world of built-in obsolescence, of fast fashion ending up in landfill, there's a need to return to the ethos from an age that Madame Clapham would recognise. Vivian Westwood looked out over a sea of wasted clothes and urged the consumer to Buy less, choose well, and make it last. This has been Rob Bell taking you through a story of Madame Clapham and her times, one of many talks on this webinar channel. Thanks for listening, and do please visit the YouTube channel, like, and subscribe. I hope to welcome you back again soon.